terms of displacement, destruction of the country. And I want to start with a short moment of silence um, to recognize the sacrifice of all of the people that we've lost in Syria. Thank you. So I am going to start off by handing it off to my friend Wad, Wad Al Khatib, who is joining us from the UK. To please introduce yourself and tell us about your work and action for Sama. Thank you so much, Lena. Uh, I mean, I'm very honored and glad and humbled to be like today with this amazing like friends and colleagues and people who I really like. I got a lot of inspiration from. Uh, my name is Wad Khatib, I'm a Syrian filmmaker and activist. Um, I was, uh, 10 years ago, as today, I was studying at Aleppo University. Um, I was doing marketing, economics, and the revolution started. And I know that so many people like feel the same thing, but I really would love to bring us back to that moment because that moment, like, although all of this now like horror and suffering and death that we've witnessed in Syria. Although we are now displaced out of our country and we can't be back, but we still feel that amazing hope and amazing feeling uh, that day 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I've never expected I would be out of Syria. I've never expected uh, I will having like now two kids living in the UK and I'm now in safe place, but my heart and my feeling my my mind all the time in Syria with the Syrian people in in different places. Um, I'm the founder of Action for Sama, uh, which is um, a campaign and organization started of, um, as a follow up to For Sama, the documentary that I've done and I've, I've doc documented five years of my life in Syria. Um, I did it as a letter to my daughter Sama, uh, who uh, was born in Aleppo who I felt that I, I have the same commitment for all of Syria, but when Sama was born was like something like more than real. Um, I'm now trying to work more to tell more stories coming out from Syria. And again, like it's very, very my pleasure to be part of this amazing panelist. Thank you, Rina. Thank you so much, Wad. Um, we got a comment from somebody that the sound is echoey. Uh, we are all on mute, but please let us know if the sound is better now. Um, for anybody who hasn't seen For Sema, it is a must. I think it's one of the most powerful films made about Syria, um, really actually one of the most powerful documentaries ever made. And, um, and it's very heroic. And so we are so proud of this film and proud of all of the achievements of, uh, of the film and um, beyond. I am going to go now to Ghalia, um, if you can um, open your camera. Ghalia Rahal is joining us actually from Idlib, from the ground, from Syria. We're so honored to have her today. Uh, we have an interpreter, Ola, um, who will be um, translating her words. And so Ghalia, please introduce yourself and tell us about your work right now on the ground and how are things right now inside Syria? مرحبا كيفكم انا كثير مبسوطه للدعوه اللي قدمتوا لي اياها مشاركه بين مجموع نساء الرائع غاليه رحال من مدينه كفرنبل بسبب تصعيد القصف على المنطقه حاليا نزحت على ريف الشمال إلى محافظة أدلب حاليا مقيمة في مخيم باريشا Olak, we can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I wasn't translating. I lost Lalia for a minute. Sorry. 
Um, so I'm so happy to be among you today, to be with such amazing woman. My name is Khalil Rahal and I am talking to you now from Syria. I am originally from Idlib city, from Kifrembel city. And because of the heavy bombardment of my area, I had to um, displace to the northern countryside of Idlib uh, province. And I live now in uh, Paris Um uh, I'm the um, founder of Mazaya Women Organization that was founded in 2013. I lost the rest. <laughs> هلق ما بعرف على أي صعيد رح أحكي لكم هو في عدة أصعيد بصراحة على الصعيد النساء أو على الصعيد السياسي بس يعني أنا حابة أحكي على الوضع العنف ضد المرأة في المنطقة والوضع الاقتصادي بشكل عام كون إنه نحنا منظمة نسائية عم نشتغل من فترة من 2013 تقريبا على تمكين المرأة خلال عمل دورات مهنية وتعليمية وسياسية ما بعرف إذا ممكن أحكي أول شيء عن منظمة مزايا وعمل منظمة مزايا بشكل عام بعدين رح أكمل مباشرة على الوضع الرهن في المنطقة على الصعيد السياسي والاقتصادي هلق فكرة مزايا في بداية تصعيد القصف الطيران على المنطقة على مدينة كفرنبل كانت تلجأ النساء للأقبية كان مجموعة من النساء يقعدوا في الأقبية خوفا من قصف الطيران وعلى طول الوقت اللي كنا نتجمع فيه كنساء في الملجأ بدأت فكرة مزايا اللي تكونت عند النساء طبعا ليش ما منحاول وقف الخوف للمعرفة والمساعدة أو الإفادة لمجموعة النساء اللي نحنا كنا متجمعات مع بعضنا ممكن نعمل ترجمة أولا؟ تماما um, um, so I don't know at when, uh, what, um, at what, what, what about should I should speak? Should I speak about the woman situation? Should I speak the, uh, about the political situation or the violence situation? What I want to talk about is the violence against women that is ongoing in the area and also the general uh, economical situation. Uh, as we are a woman organization, we were founded in 2013, and we are working on empowering women through um, courses. Uh, we do political courses, professional courses, and economical courses. Uh, I would like to start by talking about Mezaya, our center in general, and then move to speaking about the current situation in the area. Uh, the idea of Mezaya started um, as we were being bombarded, then the woman would uh, take shelter in the um, basement um, in fear of bombardment and with, with spending a lot of time in basements, uh, the idea came to change the time of fear to be a time of knowledge and help uh, and benefit. كانت رؤيتنا إلى المستقبل من في ذلك الحين توحي إلى لنا على مدى معاناة المرأة ومسؤوليتها اللي بدها تواجهها عبر السنين القادمة في ظروف الحرب انطلقنا كمتطوعات في إمكانيات جدا بسيطة أنا بدأت دور التدريب الكوافيرة لأن أنا المدربة كانت أساسا مهنتة كنا منحاول أنه نتعلم ونعلم في نفس الوقت نجعل صوت العلم والمعرفة كان يعلو صوت القصف والطيران اللي ما كان يتوقف أبدا كنا نعقد ندوات نسائية وندول الشأن العام وطرح مبادرات وأفكار ولحتى نتجاوز للضغوط الكبيرة اللي كانت علينا هذاك الوقت خلي ما سيحة للترجمة على Our vision of the future at that time uh, had given us a sense of, of uh, the suffering and the responsibility that we will be facing uh, in the coming years. We started as volunteers 
uh, with very little um, uh, with very little experience. I started uh, training uh, other girls and women on hairdressing um, because that was my original profession and other people volunteered their own knowledge as well to be passed to other women. We tried to learn and teach and make the sound of knowledge higher than the sound of uh, bombardment, which was nonstop. Uh, we, we were sitting, we were sitting all together in forums. We were trying to discuss the general affairs of the community, try to come up with new initiatives, ideas to, in order to try to bypass the, the, the pressure we were under. في شاب شاب بتطوعت في الإسعافات الأولية إنه تعطي البنات في شاب بتطوعت في النسج الصوف وتابعنا في تعليم اللغة العربية اللغة الإنجليزية ومحو الأمية طبعا لقت المبادرة التطوعية إقبال كتير كبير على المركز من قبل النساء والفتيات توسعنا عملنا في مركز مزايا النساء وشمل دورات تعليمية ومهنية وأكاديمية منتديات نسائية كتدريب على القيادة والتربية والتربية المجتمعية واللاعنف وتدريب تمكين المرأة تمكين السياسة والصحافة المكتوبة المرئية وجلسات النقاش المركزة بالإضافة لندوات ومحاضرات سياسية وحقوقية وطبعا محاضرات دعم نفسي لأنها هي كانت كتير مهمة بالنسبة لنا هذاك الوقت كنساء كمان دورات الخياطة والفنون والإسعافات الأولية والكوافيرة والنسج هذا كان داعم كتير كبير للنساء أنه يتعلموا مهنة جديدة ليطلعوا من الظروف الاقتصادية الصعبة اللي هن كانوا يعيشوها Another young woman volunteered to give first aid course Another woman knitting course And we also continued with teaching English And teaching writing and reading for uh, other women. This uh, initiative, this uh, voluntary initiative uh, had a lot of acceptance among a lot of women and girls and then we uh, expanded our work and we started giving more professional kind of courses, more um, academic kind of courses. Uh, we had women forums, we had uh, um, training, uh, leadership training, non-violence training, uh, political empowerment training, um, journalistic training, and we had discussion forums, uh, uh, and we had also um, political and uh, legal lectures. We also had uh, psychological support lectures. We had also, we kept on doing our arts um, courses in knitting and um, uh, hairdressing and so on. And this is, a, this, um, this initiative has uh, encouraged a lot of women to uh, find new jobs and start being independent. Thank you so much. Shukran kathir ghaliya ala shaglik. I wanted to underscore the organizations called Mazaya and um, the sentence that ghaliya wanted the sound of knowledge to be louder than the sound of bombs. What an inspiration you are to all women. And we are going to be sharing a link uh, throughout the webinar that has a link to all of the organizations um, today that you can check and see the bios of all of our speakers as well as the organizations to support um, work for Syria. I'm going to move now to my, uh, my friend Wafa. Everybody here is my friend. My friend Wafa Mustafa, who's going to be speaking about her activism and her extremely inspiring work um, for the detainees of Syria. And I also want to give a shout out to Sana Mustafa, who we are so proud um, to have just had join our Karam board, um, an amazing family and um, an amazing sisters. And Wafa, please introduce yourself and tell us about your work. Um, well, thank you, Lina, and um, I mean, thank you everyone for being here today, and uh, it's my pleasure um, to share this night with you. I mean, um, it's, um, I told Wad, uh, I wasn't sure that uh, that uh, I, I, I can actually attend at some point, I felt that uh, it's just uh, very difficult, uh, but uh, to be honest, I mean, commitment is obviously one uh, one reason for me being here, but but another main reason is actually you, and especially having Ghalia from Syria, so um, here I am. Uh, my name is Wafa Ali Mustafa, I'm a Syrian journalist and activist, and um, 
I don't know where to start. It's never easy to, I mean, I tell the story like uh, at least uh, twice a day, but it's still uh, very difficult. And uh, let me start by saying that um, uh, my grandmother, the mother of my father um, has died two days ago. And for that reason, actually, I was a bit, uh, and we have Clarissa. I am so mortified. I literally have been standing here. Forgive me, everyone. This is like never happens to me. Even though we've had a thousand conversations about the timing of this, I still managed to mess up the timing. And I've literally been standing here with my notes preparing for this. I'm so very excited for this. Please forgive me for being late and and bring me up to speed on where we are and and how I can... um, I'll get back in everyone's good books. Lina, would you? Yes, welcome, Clarissa. No problem. Um, I know the time change in the US really messed up everybody's calendars. But what we've done is um, Ghalia and Wad have introduced themselves. And now we will, we're on Wafa. And then we'll be going to Josie. Um, and so Wafa is, going, is telling us about her story and her work. I'm very glad to be able to hand it over to you, Clarissa. <laughs> Okay, Wafa, again, please forgive me. Um, continue telling us about your extraordinary story and the work that you're doing. Thank you, and I'm glad that, that you're here. Um, yeah, so I was just saying that, uh, um, yeah, the mother of my father, who's been actually detained now for 2,815 days, uh, has unfortunately died two days ago. And uh, for that reason, actually, I was hesitant if I wanted, if I was able actually to join today. But uh, obviously this is uh, just another day of, uh, of our lives and there's no choice but, uh, but continuing. So here I am and uh, my dad, I- Ali Mustafa has been disappeared, has been forcibly disappeared by the Syrian regime uh, since the 2nd of July 2013. And uh, yeah, I mean, briefly, my father has been political. Uh, he's a very smart person. He's open hearted. I mean, I know everyone sees their fathers as uh, very special humans, but uh, I, I, I keep uh, repeating this. My father is hopefully is still very special. And uh, I mean, he is the focus of everything I do on daily basis. Mainly I do campaigning for uh, my father's freedom and that of all Syrians disappeared, not only those detained or disappeared or kidnapped by the Syrian regime, but also everyone in every single prison or detention centers uh, uh, in Syria, And I uh, mainly also try to highlight the impact of detention and enforced disappearance on families and especially women and young uh, women. Uh, As I come from a family where uh, we are only three women actually, Uh, I have two sisters and my mom. And after the disappearance of my father, I mean, the emotional aspect is one thing that I can talk about for hours, but also uh, uh, the practical actually aspect of his disappearance um, has been very challenging. And for that reason, um, uh, I started a few years ago campaigning for his release and for his freedom. Mainly the, 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 the thing about uh, detention and enforced disappearance uh, uh, in Syria is that there is no single Syrian family who doesn't have someone who is detained or disappeared or kidnapped uh, by the regime or by other actors in the country. So this is uh, unfortunately a collective tragedy added to uh, uh, the other, the the shared tragedy that we have uh, uh, actually uh, uh, in Syria. And uh, when we talk about detention and enforced disappearance, that doesn't mean that uh, our loved ones are in prison and that we can talk to them and we can know uh, uh, what are they accused of or for what reason they are being held or uh, uh, how is their health situation. It means literally that they are forcibly disappeared. Till this day, after almost eight years, uh, we've been trying just to know if my father is still alive or not. And uh, this is unfortunately the struggle and the pain and the uncertainty that uh, millions of Syrians are living. 
Um, recently, I've started campaigning uh, uh, on my own. Uh, uh, before that, I worked with different groups, uh, but I still at the same time shared the same uh, 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 attempts, I would say, and fights uh, uh, to reveal the truth uh, uh, and the whereabouts of uh, our loved ones uh, in Syria. And uh, yeah, I, th I think I'll just stop here. I have to say, Wava, you know, listening to you talk, what I'm struck with, and I'm lucky enough to, to know most of you um, for some time now, I'm just struck by the resilience and the strength. And also there's this really strong sense of positivity, which is not easy to have that kind of resilience, to have that kind of optimism when you're dealing with a personal tragedy. And I think that's part of what makes your message and the message of all the extraordinary women on this panel so inspiring um, and certainly what makes it a real privilege for me to be here today. I wanna to show this video to everyone to give all of you who are tuning in a sense of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this extraordinary work. So let's take a look at this video. Twenty twenty was a uniquely challenging year for so many around the world. It was especially tough for Syrian health workers, human rights defenders, and humanitarians who risked their lives to save others and expose injustices. Despite the challenges, we've accomplished a lot together. The year began with intensive bombing by Russia and the Syrian regime on Idlib, and a million people were forced to move to freezing camps. In response, we delivered messages from doctors and human rights defenders in Idlib who called on the UN Secretary General to visit them and urge a ceasefire. Sayyid Guterres, تعال واشهد بنفسك كيف دولة عضو في مجلس الأمن تقصف المشافي عمدا. Outside the UN in New York, we stood with Wa'ad al Khatib, the award winning filmmaker of For Sama, to condemn Russia for bombing hospitals. Then COVID 19 struck. Syrian doctors warned that millions of people in Idlib were at risk with just 30 ventilators. The health system will be overwhelmed by the week six. We worked with them to sound the alarm and call on the WHO to improve its response. Generous supporters like you helped the white helmets disinfect schools, camps, and medical centers thousands of times. I'm in the room on WhatsApp. And allow teachers to provide remote learning bags for children who couldn't go to school because of COVID. For Syrians detained in Assad's torture prisons, the risk of COVID-19 is horrifying. Over 16,000 of us joined families of detainees to demand their immediate release. Wafa Mustafa from Families for Freedom took the cause to the world's highest forum, the UN Security Council. To have a loved one who's detained or disappeared is like waking up realizing you have lost a limb. And in Berlin, we worked with families of the missing to project their demands directly onto the Syrian embassy. Baba, Abdul Hakim Shurgaji, at the time of 2011, from the Syrian government. Zoji Fuad Ahmed Lamhamad, Muhtafi from six years. Ending with a projection of Assad behind bars. Outside the courtroom of the historic German trial of two senior Syrian regime officials accused of torture, we protested with families of detainees. And artist Khalid Baraka unveiled figures of protesters in celebration of so many who continue to stand up for human rights. We didn't stop there. 10,000 of you joined Syrian, Ukrainian, and Georgian groups to oppose human rights violator Russia joining the UN Human Rights Council. And together, we elevated the voices of families whose loved ones were kidnapped by ISIS, demanding answers about their missing loved ones. Those are some of the highlights of this year. There's much more we still need to do together in 2021. We hope you'll join us. I mean, it's 
you know, it's really, I think, impossible not to be moved by that. There are so many people who will say and feel that after 10 years, it's it's too tiring, it's too much, it's too emotional. And to see women like yourselves who are still out there every day fighting for what's right is, um, you know, it's, it's inspiring and it's really humbling. And that's why I wanted to come to Josie next because you're the only other than me non-Syrian lady on this uh, fantastic panel. And I wanna know more about, and I feel like I can totally relate to it, how Syria kind of grabbed your heart and didn't let go. Tell me about that journey. Um, yeah, that's the best kind of explanation of, of grabbing my heart and never letting go. And I just wanna start by saying how unbelievably honored I feel to be on this call with the literally the most inspiring women in the world. And I always say it's the absolute honor of my life to get to work with um, the Syrian organizations that we work with at Choose Love. Um, so uh, in, in 2015, um, I have to say, I didn't even know about, about the Syrian revolution. I didn't know anything about Syria. Um, and in 2015, that was when the refugee crisis hit Europe. Um, so in 2015, a million people arrived in Europe seeking sanctuary. Um, it was predominantly Syrians, but it was also people from Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan, Eritrea. Um, and I wanted to, to I, I was devastated to see the images on the, on the news and wanted to do something to help and tried to raise some, some money and some tents and some sleeping bags. And, and it ended up that the, the links that we set up ended up going viral. We went to Calais camp in Northern France to, to hand this money and this, the aid over and there were 10,000 people living there and we, we couldn't unsee what we'd seen. We ended up renting a warehouse and starting a distribution system and ended up becoming camp management of, of that camp and began also working in Greece and, and all along the migration route. And I was meeting so many incredible human beings from, from Syria and, um, I we were we were asking people what more can we do and a, a lot of people said to us you need to help the people who haven't who haven't got here um, and I learned about the incredible work of the White Helmets um, and we raised uh, some funding for two ambulances um, for the White Helmets um, and Ola I think that's when I first met you <laughs> um, and I, yeah my I I couldn't believe that that this what was happening was happening and that the international community wasn't doing more and that that Sy Syrians were just having to to respond to this on their own and that governments weren't doing more and that my friends didn't know about it and people weren't talking about it and um yeah so from from that moment as an organization we tried to use our platform to amplify as many messages as possible um, and learn more and more. And the, the following year in 2016, um, when um, Aleppo fell, we were able to do a, a fundraiser that was really successful. And through now knowing um, Syria Civil Defense and the Syria campaign, we were introduced to Quran Foundation and Women Now and IDA and Moham and other organizations who do the most um, incredible work. And we began, I, I traveled to Gaziantep and met the, the organizations and just learned more and more. And yeah, I, I've, I've, never, I've never seen such humanity, such heroism. Um, in my whole life, we, we work in 15 countries now as an, as an organization and I, that there's just nothing like the, the, the Syri, our Syrian friends and what our Syrian friends um, do. Uh, I've had the honor of working with, with WAD as well on the impact campaign for Fostama and the Save Idlib campaign. And um, yeah, there's just, there's, there's nothing on earth I, I feel more passionate about. I think it's, I mean, you pretty much summed it up exactly, isn't it? It's that sort of overwhelming passion that you really need to have in order to, to, to keep on doing this kind of important work. Um, and I think that leads us nicely to our, our marathon runner here, Lina Sergi Atar, who like, I mean, I remember when it was just Amal Hanano on Twitter and I was obsessed, like, who is this extraordinary writer and she's an architect and she's brilliant and she is so gifted at talking about Syria in a really evocative way that allows people who are not 
privileged enough to have traveled to Syria or spent a lot of time with Syrians to really feel um, intellectually and spiritually kind of compelled by this horrendous crisis. Um, and the thing that I am always struck about with Lena, uh, you know, in addition to like running the Kerem Foundation and the incredible work they're doing is again, it's just this like, where does this positive energy comes from? Like, where does the strength come from to be not only focused on the future, but to genuinely believe in that future at a time where frankly, the narrative is sometimes a little bit, there's no hope, there's no future, it's over, it's over. And so Lena, I'm hoping you can tell us more uh, about how Karam came to be and how it is that you are, you know, still running that marathon and do not seem to be running out of steam. I'm so excited that you're calling me um, a marathoner because I do not run and I hate running. <laughs> so like, I'll claim that now. Um, I, first of all, I mean, thank you for doing this, Clarissa, and you've been such a champion of um, the Syrian people and the Syrian people's story. And you've risked your life so many times going into Syria to cover the story. Um, and so I'm very, very honored that you're here moderating this panel. Um, Karam, we're focused on the future. I mean, it didn't start this way when we first started. I mean, Karam existed before the revolution um, since 2007. In 2011, it was, you know, all hands on deck, go in and help as much as possible. And so there were many evolutions of our work through just jumping in where we were in the crisis, which at first was field hospitals. Protesters were being shot. Um, it turned into underground schools, it turned into bakeries, it turned into so many different things. And it's so connected to what Ghalia is talking about because these activities are still happening on the ground of people just trying to survive and create um, livelihood where it's constantly being destroyed. And so that is the story of Syria for 10 years. And Karam was there and our work evolved. Um, and we also became very involved um, with the White Helmets, um, with the Syria campaign, started to make a lot of connections with different organizations. And with time, um, you know, we wanted to focus on education. I'm an architect by training and most of our team is super creative and, um, and, we, and we worked with a lot of creative people um, and we wanted to deliver what we felt was not being delivered to Syrian children which is really investing in them as human beings and investing in their creativity and their innovation and changing the way that they think about themselves. And I think that that is what Karam is doing now. Our work is mostly based in Turkey at our Karam houses, um, one in Reyhanli, which is on the Turkish border um, in Southern Turkey and one in Istanbul. And the magic of Karam house is that we are, are, are our motto is we want to build 10,000 leaders by 2028. We practice with radical generosity. Karam means generosity in Arabic. And we are very, we, we, we believe that for every refugee and every refugee child and teenager specifically, they cannot be, um, they cannot be known only for being a refugee. That doesn't define them. And we teach kids and we teach young people and we teach families that being a refugee is a circumstance. It's a circumstance of where you were born. Any of us can, could have been refugees. And, um, and we, what you need to believe in is your own potential, your own agency. So we are doing innovation. We are doing um, design-based learning. We are giving scholarships for university. We're investing in families um, so they can send their kids back to school, boys and girls. And the kids that we have been working with, they are, um, you know, they went from being in child labor to be set to studying mechanical engineering. Now we have girls from Idlib who want to be astronauts. Their dreams are so beyond even what we dreamt for them that we're just taking their lead. And that's where we get the hope from. And it's happening over and over and over. The more you give these kids, the more that they're showing us that they're ready to lead, to take care of themselves and their families and actually contribute to their host communities that we flip the narrative of refugees as a burden, refugee as somebody who has no potential, to refugee as empowered person who's ready to give and to contribute and to build. 
And that's such an important point to underscore. And I want to say as well that we're going to be obviously sharing in the chat box, like the links to some of the organizations that these fabulous women are involved with and, and ways that you can support those organizations. There's also a Q&A box there. And I do very much hope um, that we will be able to get to some Q&A during the session as well, but you can put questions in there. Um, I think we have another video that I would love to see of highlighting really some of Josie and Lena's work. Um, and let's take a look. أنا من سوريا من 2013 كان في عنا منطقتنا حصار فما كان في مواد أولية مثل الأكل والمي والكهرباء فقررنا نرجع تركيا نحن أول ما جينا كنا عم نشتغل هون أجد منظمة كرم تعرف أختي حكوا معا منين أنتوا وين بيتكون أجوا على بيتنا شافوا شافونا كل هاتنا عم نشتغل فقالوا لنا أنه في عنا اقتراح لكم لأمي قال نبعت أبنائكم للمدرسة ونعطيكم كفالة بعد المدرسة في عنا بيجع بيت كرم في له نشاطات منيحة في عنده ورشات أنا بجي على بيت كرم مرتين لثلاث مرات في الأسبوع فيه بقابل كتير من رفقاتي المشاركين هون بيحبوا يجوا على بيت كرم لينموا مهاراتهم وقدراتهم بالبناء والتفكير طبعا هذا كله من خلال الاستديوهات اللي بيقدمها بيت كرم من فترة مو بعيدة شاركنا باستديو الأطراف الصناعية وسوى بنينا مشروع على بنت صغيرة عندها مشكلة بأحد أطرافها بعد كم سنة رح صير طالبة جامعة مت الطلاب اللي هلا انتجين بمنحة كرم ورح روح على الجامعة وادرس لحتى حقق حلمي انا بدرس في جامعة ادنى كلية الهندسة فرع الجيولوجيا عن طريق احد الاصدقاء دريت في كرم ومنحة كرم فضلت عليها والحمد لله قبلت فيها بعد المقابلة وال... فكتير سهلت علي الطريق منحة كرم كان المميز فيها ان هي عن جد كرم يعني بتغطي تقريبا 90% من مصاريف الطالب كطالب Again, I mean, you, you watch that and you feel so inspired and you also realize that the power of narrative in all of this, what's the narrative that we hear about Syria? What's the narrative that we hear about the revolution? What's the narrative that we hear about refugees? And what can, well, what are these women doing to try to kind of turn that on its head and establish a different sense of understanding about what it means to be a refugee and, and, and what the future is for Syria. I wanted to, because I, because I was egregiously late, I didn't get to hear from Ghalia um, yet. So I wanted to hear a bit more from Ghalia. And Ghalia, I'm going to talk a little bit in Arabic, but I'm going to talk a lot. Alhamdulillah, I'm going to speak in I'm going to speak in English because I feel too shy. But um, I just want to get your impression when you're listening to these women, these extraordinary Syrian women, and Josie, an extraordinary honorary Syrian woman for the purposes of today, and you're hearing about the work they're doing, and you're seeing the way they're shifting the narrative, they're changing the way that people think of Syrians, the way they look at this conflict. Do you feel that has an impact on the ground uh, for you and, and other women who are trying to sort of work in the same, towards the same goals that you are? أم غالية لما بتسمع هدول النساء السوريات وجوزي اللي رح نعتبرها سورية اليوم عم عم كيف عم يغيروا القصة وعم عم يغيروا قصة سوريا كيف عم تنحكى شو انتباعك وهل هي هي المشاركة إلى تأثير عليك وعلى النساء اللي مثلك اللي عم يشتغلوا بسوريا لنفس أهداف تماما اللي عم يشتغلوا مشان هدول النساء أه 
هلق بشكل عام ما بده كثير تفسير وضع المرأة السورية في ظروف الحرب يعني هي تقريبا مهمشة جدا تتعرض للاستغلال ما عندها إمكانيات اقتصادية أبدا محرومة من كثير مقومات من الحياة نحن فعلا في عملنا مع في المراكز النسائية مع النساء والفتيات اليافعات يعني قد ما حسنا نحن نطور في وضع المرأة لحتى تكون هي في المقدمة منضل من لقى صعوبات في عنا صعوبات ومن وجه تحديات كتيرة من قبل المجتمع لحتى نوصل رسالتنا السلمية بشكل عام وضع المرأة السورية في منحسن نقول في استغلال كتير كبير في تعنيف في تعنيف من قبل أولا من قبل المجتمع من قبل العائلة إن كان تعنيف ضرب أو تعنيف قتل قتل الروح أو كان حرمانها من حق تقرير المصير أو حرمانها من حقوقها الحياتية بشكل عام منها زواج القاصرات منها تعنيف العائلة إن كان ضرب من ناحية الزوج أو الأهل طبعا نحن كمنظمة مزايا في عنا مكتب قانوني المكتب القانوني مهمته يوثق حالات التعنيف عند النساء والفتيات مع أعطاء استشارات قانونية مجانية ترجمة علا Um, in, in general, uh, in general, we, can, we we don't need to explain a lot the situation of the Syrian women in this uh, in this war. Uh, she's being marginalized, she's being uh, abused, and she's being used as well. The, she has no um, economical um, capabilities. She has no uh, not not even the simplest uh, life needs. Um, in our work with the women and girls uh, and young young women uh, in in Syria, we're trying to. Um, uh, elevate their um, capabilities. We're trying to develop their uh, situation. We're always facing difficulties. We're always facing challenges. A lot of challenges, especially to deliver our our peaceful uh, message. Um, the women in Syria are being used. They are being uh, um, abused as well from the society and from their families. Uh, they are denied their self determination rights. Um, they are having not the basic life rights. There, are, there is uh, a lot of um, violence from husbands. There's a lot of uh, young girls' marriage. There's a lot of, uh, the, the families are not helping as well. We have a, uh, we in Masaya have a legal office that is tasked, uh, is to document these cases and provide um, advices and consultation. Uh, معنا إمكانيات نوفر الحماية للمعنفات مثل مثلا بيت حماية ولا في ظل ظروف اللي ما فيها أمن وما فيها سلام وما فيها حكومات حكومة تفصل لذلك نحن في الوضع العشوائي هذا أكيد المرأة هي أول حدا بتنتهك حرمته أو بتنتهك حقوقه بظن أنه شقد ما نوصل عن معاناة المرأة السورية في الداخل السوري عبر الناشطات أو وسائل الإعلام ما بيصل جزء بسيط جدا من معاناتها في الداخل كون أنه أنا حاليا أسكن في مخيم باريشة مع النساء في خيمة أبواجه نفس المعاناة اللي بتواجهها النساء فقدان كل مقومات الحياة وأقل خصوصية هي إنه حتى على مستوى استعمال التواليت في المخيمات كتير صعب عليه. Um, we in Mazaya we don't have the um, possibilities to provide protection for uh, abused women. We don't have a kind of prote protection house for them. And, and in, the, in the current situation where they don't have any peace and security and there's no acting government, the situation is very difficult for women and women end up being the, the, easiest, uh, the easiest part for their rights to be um, taken away.
Um, however, we speak about the suffering of the Syrian woman right now, we cannot but deliver a very, very small piece of the whole uh, problem. I live right now in a camp with women and we are having the issues with our even basic needs, even the need to um, access uh, sanitary facilities is very uh, difficult for us. And it's, that's the basic thing for us. ما بنسى ابدا وجه بنت اسمها دلال التجأت لنا لمنظمه مزايا كانت قاصر عمرها 16 سنه ومعها طفل صغير عمره 6 شهور وهن ناسحين من ريف حما طبعا جوزها تعرض لحادث سير وهي صارت مسؤوله عن زوج معاق وعن طفل وعنها هي وهي قاصر اساسا طبعا هاي الحوادث كتير بتمر على كتير بنات طفلات نساء حملني مسؤولية الأمومة وهن صغار بالإضافة تخيلوا يعني الاستغلال بيجي من مثلا منظمات مجتمع مدني منظمات إغاثية بتتعرض النساء للتحرش للاستغلال الجنسي بسبب طلب وظيفي أو طلب حاجة ما لتأمين احتياجاتها اليومية لها ولأطفالها طبعا هي البنت نحن قدمنا لها مساعدة تدريب مهنة ووظفناها في عقد عمل مكناها على الصعيد الاجتماعي والاقتصادي وعطيناها شوية دعم نفسه لحتى صار عندها عقد في روضة مزايا روضة الأطفال صار عندها عقد دائم وبتشتغل فيه ومساندة جيدة لأولادها ولعائلتها طبعا إذا تأمن هذا الظرف لكل النساء ولكل الفتيات في سوريا أكيد راح يكون الوضع أفضل بس اقتصاديا غير متوفر الوضع الاقتصادي وتأمين وظائف عامة للنساء I cannot forget the face of Dalal of very innocent Dalal she was carrying her child that is 7 months old and she was 16 years old She's uh, displaced from the countryside of Hama with her husband and child, but unfortunately the husband was in a car accident and, and he cannot move anymore. So right now she has to support uh, him and her child. She needed a safe place and the work when she came to us. Um, that's, not, that's not just a, uh, one case. That's one of many several cases where um, uh, female children end up responsible for a family. Um, they are also, These females are also being subjected to use from the even the um, civil society organization sometimes, and sometimes the aid organization. Sometimes they are harassed and they are sexually extorted just for uh, aid or for a job that they need to secure their family's basic needs. We trained uh, Dalal and we um, gave her a safe uh, place. We gave her psychological support and we. Um, empowered her economically and we kept on supporting her until she got a job contract and right now she works full time for us. If we were able to provide such help to uh, all the women that are in need in Syria, then the situation would definitely be better. And, and despite all the problems in the economical situation, such help would make the situation much better. I think, you know, Ghalia raises such an important point here that's easy to forget because we focus so much on the violence in war, right? We focus on the bombs, we focus on the bloodshed, we focus on the massacres, the disappeared, the prisons, that it's easy to forget there is a whole huge part of suffering of living in a war zone that comes from things that are by comparison seemingly banal things like what you're talking about, Ghalia, violence against women, car accidents, conditions in camps. Um, and this is a whole side of, of war that too often gets ignored, but is incredibly difficult and dangerous for those people who are, who are trying to survive through it. And when you talk about violence against women, I, I can't help but thinking of you, Wad, and the work that you've done and Part of what makes your voice so powerful is the fact that you're a woman and you're a mother and the things you have seen, the experiences you've had, it's, it's just this like incredibly powerful combination. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you think being a woman and being a mother has given your work 
something special, something different, something powerful, something unique that maybe we wouldn't see from a man's work. Do have... oh, this is for Wa'ed, but Wa'ed, can you hear me? That's on the Wa'ed then. Yeah, uh, so I mean, it's phrased a little bit, but I, I think I got the question. Um, like, I think being a woman in that position, like, make you look and see the situation in totally different uh, situation. When you, when I was there, um, like naturally, I was looking a lot at other women who were like, who they were pregnant or they had children or they were uh, like looking at the situation from like kind of like ignorance, um, like perspective. Um, as you just mentioned, like people knows about war, people look at this position as it, um, like the bombs, the fighting, the, um, more about like the very direct uh, impact of, of war, but not a lot of people, even us when we were living there, we're looking about these things as secondary things. But you face this every day, you wake up every day looking at these situations and these challenges as a woman, challenging as a woman, and you can't really like, you know, like kind of get it the, even the, the like the care that uh, like you need or, or they need. So, during these five years, I was like, from my perspective, like filming naturally, filming what I was like looking at. But then when I was dis uh, displaced and I arrived to Turkey, I started to look back at this archive and see how like naturally as a woman, my eyes were, were always looking at this details of that situation there, other women, other children. And so many people were like telling me, oh, oh why like lots of your film is about children? I mean, because how that's how the life was there. It's all about children, because children were at every level of that circumstances. And literally, the I just feel that from Ghalia, from what she's saying, the inspiration we can take as women from other women, like now to hear that what, the work about Ghalia, which I follow always, but to hear now from Ghalia, it's totally another like perspective. And I mean, we, I can say like, there's lots of that hope that I'm keeping every day from people like Wafa, like Yulina, like Ghalia and all the other great and amazing activists who are every day still like continuing what we left uh, behind now. Um, like Josie and what you are doing and everything like Choose Love is providing for so many like of us, especially me and the campaign. That's, that's what keep me going and keep me feeling that yeah, there's so many people is caring about us. Um, to go back to the woman in Syria and the situation that like still happening until today. And like just a couple of days, we we had like the Mother's Day here in, in the UK. Next week, it's Mother's Day in, in, uh, in Syria and in the Arab world. And just thinking about them as a mother now, which I have two daughters, both now at school in safe place, Literally, I can't stop thinking about other other women, about what we can do here from outside. Yeah, maybe I feel so much like guilty and I have to feel this because yeah, I left them and now I'm in very like different position and different situation, but we have to do everything we can do from here to them. Um, so I, I, I know like each of us like doing like different work, but at the end, all of this will be supporting people like Ghalia and like the woman who Ghalia is working with. And that's the most important thing. I think, yeah, I mean, I couldn't have said it better, certainly. Um, and what you're saying about, you know, once you're a mother, you can't look at other mothers in, in that situation and not feel from to your core, the profound pain and fear of not being able to look after your family, of not being, sure that you can provide security and, and hope and happiness for them. Um, and I want us to watch another video now, uh, just because I know I'm hitting this stuff really hard, but like we're here today to remember 10 years of tragedy in Syria, but we're also here to like 
celebrate the incredible work that is still being done. This war is still going. This conflict is ongoing. We can't just forget about it and think it's in the past. And so um, I think it's really important that we keep remembering the, the, the different uh, organizations that these women represent and the work that they're doing. So we're going to see a bit more about Josie's organization, Choose Love here. And um, yeah, and there'll be also ways for people to reach out and donate. Take a look. I totally have ghost bumps. I think it's also partly because of the amazing music as well as the amazing work. But Josie, I just wanted to ask you, how do you keep, look, we're in this tremendous anxious moment. It's COVID, everybody's freaked out. Everybody's stuck at home. Everybody is very preoccupied with their own stuff. How do you keep people engaged with a conflict like Syria? How do you keep them caring? And, and how do you maintain that momentum? It, it's such a good question. And I think it's a question that, that doesn't necessarily, um, that I don't necessarily know the, the answer to, but I think, especially in thinking about Syria, it feels like there have been these, there are moments where the media turns its attention and then the media turns its, its attention off. And it feels so unjust that there are these corporations and uh, like certain individuals and the systems of power that ha that have that ability to raise awareness and then turn it off and in those moments where awareness gets raised that's when advocacy can happen that's when campaigning can happen that's when organizations get funding um that's when the international community will then fund organizations and i, I feel like so often we hear we hear we have hear from our partners and they'll say we got we got these big grants from wherever the various institutions in those moments where things are on the news and then when it's it's not in the news anymore um that, that those grants stop and and the, the funding stops as well um i i think for, for us as choose love we kind of see our role in the with the community that we have to to keep that awareness um and to not for it not to be us like owning the, the narrative and for us to use our platform to amplify the messages of our partners and the incredible, incredible activists that we have the absolute privilege of working with. I think the kind of, it's difficult. I think those, those moments where we, where we see the absolute devastation are really important because that, that is what drives people to do something for me, seeing, seeing, the white helmets pull babies from the rubble that that for me is what drove me to drove me to do this work but then actually it's the amazing women doing amazing things it's it's the all the amazing work it's the children it's the young leaders that is is the driver and i think that we all have a responsibility to keep telling those stories and keep platforming those stories and that that's how ultimately change is going to happen and how we're going to keep people engaged and it's it's all about changing the narrative the narrative has has gone 
so wrong. And then I also think as a, as a British, very privileged person, I feel very, that there, there are people in so many different institutions that have got to stop being silent with their complicity and they have got to step up and say what what is happening is wrong and these institutions that we're part of are not are not working and and we all have a responsibility to push for that change as well and certainly as you said it's like those changes and that push and that energy comes from people well like all of you um but you know Wafa when I when I look at you I'm struck I mean beside your incredible ferocity and tenacity and everything I'm I'm also struck by how young and how beautiful you are and how intense this is to be growing up in through a revolution right and like where most people were out doing normal sort of teenage things you were already having to adapt and evolve into this kind of extraordinary role and I just wonder if you can give us like some perspective on like what it is like to grow up in a revolution. Um, well, yeah. You know that I, I, I mean, like to make it uh, very short, I didn't even have time to think of such a question. I, I didn't and I still don't. And uh, I mean, I mean, obviously I come from a quiet political family. So my father has been detained even before the revolution, you know? So like prison has always existed in my life. Uh, protests have always been part of my life. I went on my first protest with my father when I was 10. Uh, and for like six years in a row, I protested with my dad every single Thursday uh, in solidarity with other causes like Palestine and Iraq. And, uh, and this, is, this is how I grew up. And I mean, since I was very young, I, I realized that my father was different from other people I know. My family was different from other families. And, um, but to be honest, I mean, this difference um, uh, is 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 not easy and uh, is uh, we I would say that we and and obviously today millions of Syrians have paid uh, a very high price for that. When the revolution started, I was twenty one, and uh, I mean I I don't even remember like uh, I don't I don't even remember how did I go to my first protest during the revolution after the revolution broke out. I've been like for days sitting and like focusing and saying okay I'll just remember details so I was there who did I call like how did I know about this pro I remember nothing the only thing I remember is being among the crowd in front of the Umayyad mosque in Damascus on the 25th of March and just being amazed by the amount of people chanting freedom for hours and just feeling that this is a moment of truth. I am here and I belong to this country. I belong to these people. And yes, I also want freedom. I was young and, uh, and, uh, and probably, I mean, uh, um, the way I was raised and my dad has, has obviously a big uh, uh, role in, in why and how I was involved. But uh, I was detained when I was 21. I, I got detained at the, at the, in September 2011 for a couple of days. I mean, obviously, this is one thing also, like I, by now, by the, uh, when we're talking about the 10th anniversary, I've been always asked by the media about my detention and I tend not to speak about it for one reason. I don't recall much from my detention period because I got detained and then I was released and then I had to get involved again. I protested every day for two years. Two, two years later, I started losing my friends and then my dad got disappeared. And then I had to flee the country with my mom and my sister who was 13 back then. We fled illegally to Turkey and a week after my dad's disappearance as three women in a new country with, with our passports, nothing else, no money, no relatives, nothing. We had to establish a life from scratch as if we don't have a father 
who we don't even know if he's alive or not. We don't, we didn't, and, and we still don't have time to grieve and uh, to think of the country, the family, the house, the places I knew, the people I, I knew, all, all of whom we lost. And till today, to be honest, I mean, I, I don't even have time to think about that. And, and, and I recall, I don't recall much of my detention period because my mind is trying to deal with the most uh, 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 important uh, reality that is my father's disappearance. But I know that my, my detention, for example, is somewhere in the back of my head, but I cannot even deal with that trauma today. And for the past uh, 10 years, uh, I would say, this is the only thing I've been doing. And uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm grateful that I was raised uh, uh, by this person, by this man, by this family, because every time I feel very helpless today, I hear his voice telling me that it is worth it. And all this pain and this uh, uncertainty and this uh, helplessness sometimes is worth it. Probably this is not about me, you know? I mean, this is not about me having a chance to live a free and just democratic Syria, but this is about others. And this is why I'm very proud of myself and of the father that I have, because he raised me to be able to accept that it's fine. Everything I do is not only about me, it's also about others. And uh, I, the results I might not witness, but it's enough for me that someone will. It's, you know, I mean, hearing you speak, it's like, it's just impossible not to be moved by, you know, your extraordinary words and your courage, but also that spirit of, you know, which is really, you don't find it that often in the West, this idea like there is something more important. There is a collective whole that is bigger than my personal happiness. And I think when I look at all the conflicts that I've covered and why it is that I have found Syria like so utterly consuming and so heart-wrenching, is because I have always been struck by this extraordinary bravery of people who invested in this uprising to just put their life to the side and invest in an idea, basically, right? And be willing to give everything to that idea. And I'm seeing so many notes coming in. I don't know if you're seeing them as well, Wafa, but you know, I mean, everybody is, is really inspired and moved by your incredible, incredible words. I promise you guys, I'm seeing your Q&A coming in. I am gonna start asking them very shortly. I just wanna ask one more question of Lena before we start opening it up to Q&A. And, you know, Lena, I think you have such an unusual perspective on all of this because as somebody, you know, you're living in the US and but you're going back and you're involved and your life is in two places and you're sort of split between two places. and. And that can be incredibly difficult to navigate and incredibly painful um, to know how to exist in two places at the same time. But I just wonder, because you're such a reflective person and such a beautiful writer, if you have like a biggest lesson that you've learned from this, this, this 10 years of revolution or something that keeps you going or something that you keep coming back to. I don't know what it might be, but something that you might share with us um, that you've learned along the way. Absolutely, thank you, Clarissa. It's being split between two places, it's been something that I've had my entire life since I was born um, because I was born in the US and we moved back to Syria when I was 12 and I moved back to the US and I felt all my life and when living in Syria, everybody would ask me, oh, which place do you like better? You like Syria more, right? More than America. And I'd always feel like, I kind of like America, but I, don't, I love Syria. And then like when the revolution began, everything kind of shifted exactly in the opposite way. I mean, there's no place in the world that I want to be more than Aleppo. Um, and so it's, all, it's always been this way. I, um, I wanted to, um, say to Wafa that, and this, I got very emotional when you're speaking. Every time you speak, I feel very emotional. But um, you, when you mentioned even the protests of March 25, I remember on March 23rd, 
um, I, I was um, standing in front of my house. It was starting to become spring here. We were watching everything that was happening in Syria since the 15th and even before then. And I knew that was when I knew that if I don't write something down and that, uh, that um, I'll have to tell my children that I was, too, that I was silent. And, um, and my kids at the time were six and four. And, um, and I realized that I was so late. I was so late on March 23rd because I'd been silent for a week. Um, so to know that you were out on that protest, I did write for you and for everybody in that time um, and hoping that the entire country would stand together and, um, and be united because we could have had a different outcome. Um, I wanted to say before we open up the Q&A is that uh, I'm so, so honored to be on this panel with these amazing women. Um, I want to say to the audience, and I know probably everybody in this audience supports this cause, um, but if you are ever asked or if somebody ever asked you, because as Syrians we get asked this a lot, what is the alternative? We've been hearing this for all of these years. So what is the alternative to this regime? Um, what is, there are no, or, or journalists would tell me, um, there are no good guys left in Syria. And I want to say that here in this panel, Wafa and Wad and Ghalia, this is the alternative. It's not even the alternative. This is this what was possible. And, and there are so many good women and so many good men. And you can see even from what they've accomplished with throughout all of this, there, it was always possible to have an outcome that was completely different from what we have right now. And they represent thousands of women and thousands of men that were the alternative. And the children that we support today are the alternative. And so this is an unfair question to ask Syrians because we always had something better within us. We were never allowed to express this. And to Josie, I wanna say thank you for standing with us. And thank you for inspiring other people that are not Syrian to stand for us and uh, stand with us. And, um, and so many non-Syrians who've supported us throughout the years, we thank them for their solidarity. And to you, Clarissa, for all of your extraordinary journalism and all of the journalists who risk their lives to come into Syria to, to report the truth, to tell our stories, because we were never allowed to tell our truths. I thank you and all of your colleagues and, um, and the memory of uh, Mary Colvin and Anthony Shadid, who died telling their stories. To Ghalia, Emil Shahid, Allah irham Khalid, Allah irham Ra'id. And to Wafa, Allah yifik asr abuki, wa Allah yifik asr kill al Thank you, everybody, so much for being on this panel. It really is something that's so important to us today. I mean, so beautifully put, Lena. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm going to start going to some of these questions because there's like so many of them and they're all really good questions. And um, oh, forgive me. Let me just work out where to start here. Um, uh, oh my gosh, it's like so many questions. Okay, I have a couple of questions coming up for Ghalia. Um, because unsurprisingly, so many people are really inspired by the amazing work um, that, that Ghalia is doing. And I'm going to kind of synthesize, like, because I'm seeing a few, like one from uh, the wonderful Sausan Asfari, um, who actually is asking something that quite a few other people have asked as well, which is, you know, when women get their training and they start working, do they get more respect from family members, or do they have to contend with resentment or violence from the men in the family who maybe are uncomfortable with their newly empowered female family member? So that's for Ghalia, please. Ghalia, a question for you. There are a lot of people who have heard from you and want to ask you a question. There is a question for you, Mr. Asfar, and a question for you always. When they start working on women, آه عندكم بالمراكز وبيحصلوا على عمل هل بيحصلوا احترام أفضل من قبل عائلاتهم من قبل المجتمع ولا هل بيضطروا يتعاملوا مع سلوك عدائي من قبل الرجال بعائلتهم اللي قد ما يوافقوا على أنه هني يشتغلوا مثلا أو يتعاملوا هلق بسبب الظروف الاقتصادية السيئة اللي بتمر فيها سوريا بشكل عام والشمال كمان 
لا المرأة ما بتواجه أبدا تحديات من قبل عائلتها إذا كانت العائلة معتازة اقتصاديا أنه تقدم لعائلتها وبتكون هي المعيلة الوحيدة لأن أغلب الأحيان والنسيج الأكبر من من مجتمعنا صار نساء وهي معيلات لأطفالها لذلك هي مجبورة أنه تلاقي عمل وتشتغل كون أنه ما في معيل لها يعيلها لذلك بيتركوها أنه إيه إذا لقيت شغل اشتغل بس هو إمكانية ملاقات العمل هلا أغلب منظمات الداعمة ما تقريبا بت بتسيس وضع تقديم الدعم على حسب الوضع السياسي للمنطقة نحن وقت بيتصعد القصف عنا بينقطع الدعم فترة طويلة وهذا الشيء بيأثر كمان على النساء اللي بلاقين فرص عمل في المنطقة لذلك بينقطع ال الإعالة عن عائلتها بتلاقي صعوبة أكيد بس كمجتمع عام لا ما فيها الزهرة هاي الزهرة تراجعت جدا في الصعوبات الاقتصادية اللي عم بتواجهها النساء حاليا As a result of the current economical problems in Syria um, especially in the north the women don't, feel, don't uh, face any challenges from the family or any pressure uh, not to work especially if the family is in economical need and uh, We have to notice that the biggest percentage of people right now in, in, in the North are women and, and they are uh, the supporter, the sole supporters of their families and their children. So they have to work and they can, they can work. The only problem is actually finding, finding jobs. That's the problem. Most of the organizations that support the area, they, have, uh, they change their support according to the political situation. For example, with the increase of bombardment, we see a decrease in support. And that decrease in support leads to fewer jobs available for women, and so women, less women can work. Uh, but this, this issue of objecting to women working has uh, declined a lot with the current economic situation. Well, you <laughs> want to think that... Sorry. No, go on. Continue. بس تكملي للجواب. هو عزمان قبل الثورة كان في أشخاص على حسب المجتمعية والنسيج السوري في في أفراد بيمنعوا عمل المرأة من قبل الثورة من من قبل أحداث الحرب هني نفسهم بجوز في فئة من قبل وفئة من الآن تعرض عمل المرأة كفئة قليلة جدا. Um, ever since the before the revolution there was this uh, uh, small group of community who would object to women working anyway. So maybe those still object right now, but they are not, not so many, they are a few. And it's, you know, it's hard to think of that as being like a positive thing. The situation is so dire that, that men are not objecting to the women working. Um, it's sort of like the, the right attitude, but for the wrong reason, maybe. Um, and again, Ghali, I hope you're just feeling the love because I can't tell you, I know most of these messages are in English, but everyone is just blown away by you. So, um, But I have another question, and this one, I think, Wad, I would love for you to, to go for this one. This is from Dom, uh, and Dom wants to know, how can we, and by we, I think he probably means, you know, non-Syrians in the audience who are tremendously moved and inspired by all of you, how can we embody the spirit of the Syrian revolution, he's asking. Uh, I mean, there's 12 million Syrians all over the world, maybe 6 million like internally displaced inside Syria, but there's other like 6 million who are all over the world. So I'm sure like whenever you were in this world, there's like you can find a Syrian neighbor or something. Um, I mean, like literally the, the main way is to talk to Syrian uh, and because now it's social media and all of this like everyone work is online and you can really watch and see all of this amazing stories um we are just now here like five uh, different women each one of us like presenting part of the uh, fight in syria but there is so many other like syrian and organization and i think each one of us even in our websites and in our in our work we always like refer to other people work and literally like meet these Syrian people, try to speak with them, um, like try to watch and see what they were doing. And I think that's the main thing, you know, like to build this connection and to, to understand, to see, and to find the truth. Um, Claire, so what you were doing in Syria and really like you were one of the people who inspired me as much as so many other 
um, like Syrian people who hold cameras like in the revolution. But the truth and to find this is something might be sometimes difficult because of the propaganda and the thing that the, the Assad regime supported by Russia are trying to do. But at the same time, like it, the truth is existed and it's everywhere. And just like people need to open their eyes and their hearts and listen to the Syrian people, listen about what they want or what we want to tell them. Um, I think that's like the main thing, how, how, they, how, how, how I could answer this question. Well, I think you answered it beautifully. And, you know, your work and your films are such a big part, right, of building that connection across borders, across nationalities, religions, gender. It just doesn't matter. You watch these films and if you're a human being, you feel moved, you care, you become inspired, you become engaged. And, and, and that's... That's really what it's all about. Yeah, and like you know, even myself when I working when I was working on For Summer, I've been told through like pro editing the film and even after that, literally in the sentence, like no one is coming to watch another Syrian film, and I almost believed that. Like even in in like in my heart, I thought that I'm doing this film for my daughter, for my people, for the people of Aleppo, for everyone who knew about the revolution or part even of the the revolution. And I'm kind of like, you know, hurt to that like sentence. But then when, while I was touring around, like the film went to places I've never even like heard about. And I saw how people were just want to know and want to do something, not just like want to know. And that's what I felt like there is things to be done and there's things to be even told more and more. And even if it's for no one else out of us in the world, but for us to remember, because in the, most difficult moments, as I think everyone mentioned part of that now, but we almost forget why this is started and why this is very important. But we don't want to forget this. We don't want to like let our children or the next generation to forget about this. We want to keep the story and we want everyone to know about it. That's so important. And that's a look, that's why we're here today and having this conversation. It's about keeping this story alive and vivid and real in people's uh, in people's minds. Um, thank you very much. Well, I, I have a question now for Wafa and this is coming from Nuran. Hello everyone and thank you for this panel. I've got a question for Wafa. As she mentioned, she's advocating on her own right now. I'd like to know why she choose to work, chose to work apart from other organizations. How is it different? And how does her work frame look like apart from organizations? And are you looking for a different kind of support at some point, Wafa? Uh, well, yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, um, as I mentioned, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm campaigning on my own capacity, but that doesn't mean that I work by myself. Obviously, as you've seen in the video, I've, uh, I'm, I'm collaborating on daily basis on different uh, uh, events, in, in many different ways with different organizations like the Syria campaign. Uh, uh, I also, uh, some, I, I, I get a huge support from Action for Sema every day. Uh, and I work also closely with other families of, of, of detainees and this appeared in Syria. Uh, so it's not, I'm not alone and that, uh, that uh, it's just that uh, uh, due to uh, uh, time and capacity, I chose at some point just uh, uh, to be uh, less uh, like committed to uh, one uh, single organization. Uh, but that doesn't doesn't change anything I do and doesn't change the fact that I'm not alone at all. Uh, and uh, that everything I used to do when I was part of any organization or uh, uh, even before that I'm still doing and I'm still receiving uh, support, great support from great people on daily basis. Um. I'm mindful that we're we're running out of time, and um, which is always kind of heartbreaking when you're having a conversation like this. And I so wish that we could be having it in person, but I can't tell you all what a privilege it's been to participate in this, to hear your stories. I feel like I'm sure everyone who's watching feel I feel like so charged up right now. I'm like, yes, let's go do it, you know. 
Um, and that is a really good feeling. And it's a really good feeling to have in relation to Syria. And all of you are an absolute inspiration. And I hope that everybody who has been watching feels, feels that profoundly. And I just want to encourage everyone again to remember that like, you know, you can take action too. Uh, action for Sama, the Syria campaign, Choose Love, Mazaya, uh, the Karim Foundation. Um, these are amazing organizations. They're doing incredible work. They need your help. They need everybody's help. And it doesn't matter how much help. It can be the tiniest amount of help. It's about pointing your heart in the right direction and making a small step. So please, I urge you to go to karamfoundation.org slash 10 years. It's, it's in, the, in the chat box. You can see it there. Learn more about these organizations. Learn more about how you too can participate in this process. And just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, ladies, thank you so much for allowing me to be uh, part of this panel. And, you know, I um, bless everyone and, and good night and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, everybody.